We look today at the story of Hezekiah, uh, who was known for the situation where the Assyrians were going to conquer Jerusalem, and he prays to God, and God delivers them. Now, normally, when we look at Hezekiah, we see it as a story about how if you pray to God and trust in him, God will deliver you, and that's certainly all true. But today we want to focus on maybe kind of the bigger picture of how Hezekiah and this whole story fits into the whole plan that God has for vacation, for salvation for us. Now you hear, you see here uh, archaeological find of a coin that tells us this Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, did exactly exist. And we certainly know from outside of the Bible, the history of what happened with Assyria. Assyria was a great empire around 1300 BC, but what happened after that is it did to a lot of the places in the Near East, it went on a decline. And during that period of decline, that's when the people, children of Israel, went into the Promised Land under Joshua. But what happens now later is Assyria has a resurgence, and in this resurgence, it is a threat now to the nation of Israel, which by this time now is divided in half. In the north, it's called Israel, and the south, it's called Judah. The Babylonians are known, uh, the Assyrians are known for their brutal military, and they were universally hated by people because of that. <clears throat> now, during that decline period, Aram, or Syria, who we heard a lot last week with Naaman, was very prominent. And we hear, see here about King Ben-Hadid, the king of Syria, or Aram, and that he mustered his entire army, accompanied by 32 kings with their horses and chariots. He went up besieged Samaria and attacked it. And we hear the Zachar steel here, this is an archaeological find, that tells us about that. Here it says, Isaac, our king of Hamath, and Loish, bar Hadad, son of Hazael, king of Aram, that's Syria, united against me 17 kings. All those kings laid siege to Hazrak. Baal Shayim said to me, do not be afraid. I will save you from all those kings who have besieged you. But with the resurgence of Assyria, this is called Neo-Assyria, and you see their war chariot here, Assyria begins to conquer the lands to the west, which includes, as you see, eventually it's going to conquer everything in the area all the way down to Egypt. But Judah is spared because of God's intervention under Hezekiah. Here we see an example of the Assyrian siege machines, a battering ram here. And here we see the way that they would execute people is they would just kind of impale them on a stick on a pole until they died. And this is in their drawings. They were proud of this. And you see here an example of how they would take the dead bodies and bury them. In fact, what they would do around conquered cities is they would take the skulls of the enemies they had killed and put them in massive piles for everybody to see. It was a warning. This is what happened if you tried to face Assyria. They were the evil. They were the Nazis of the Old Testament. And here's an example how proud they felt about it. I cut off their heads and formed them into pillars. Bubu, son of Buba, I flayed the city of Arabella and I spread his skin upon the city wall. I flayed, which is skinned, all the chief men who had revolted and covered the pillar with their skins. I flayed many within the border of my own eye, I flayed and spread their skins upon the wall. I cut off the limbs of the officers, the royal officers who had rebelled. 3,000 captives I burned with fire. Their corpses I formed into pillars. I made one pillar of the living, another of the heads. I bound their heads at two posts around the city. From some I cut off their hands and their fingers, and from others I cut off their noses, their ears, their fingers, and many I put out their eyes." Here is their god Asur, as you see he is a warrior god. And this gives you an idea about the Assyrians and how they were, felt about themselves and how others felt about them. Here is also their god Enil who replaced in southern Assyria Asur, but still the same kind of violent god. Asur 
as described, as you see him here, as a winged disc with horns enclosing four circles around a middle circle. Rippling rays fall down on either side of the disc. A cycle or wheel suspended from wings enclosing a warrior drawing his bow to discharge his arrow. The same circle, the warrior's bow, however, is carried in his left hand while the right hand is uplifted as to bless his worshipers. And the cycles talk about the chariots, the moving, that he is a god of conquest. He's not just to stay there. He's a god who wants to conquer other lands and the bow and arrow being the sign of his power. And he's hoping that as he does this, people will succumb to him and worship. And here you see the Assyrian Empire, the first of the great Near Eastern empires. Uh, the next ones will be the Babylonians, then the Persians, then the Greeks under Alexander the Great, and finally the Romans. Isaiah 7 alludes to the Babylonians. The Lord will bring on you and your people, on the house of your father, a time unlike since Ephraim broke away from Judah. This is God's prophet Isaiah speaking to King Ahaz, the king of Judah in the south. And when he says Ephraim, that's another word, that's the dominant tribe in northern Israel, describing them and saying, this is the worst thing that can happen to you since the kingdom divided <clears throat> after the death of Solomon in two. And what is the bad thing? He will bring the king of Assyria. In that day, the Lord will whistle for flies from the Nile Delta in Egypt and for bees from the land of Assyria. They will come and settle in the steep ravines and the crevices and the rocks and all the thorn bushes and all the water holes. So using this example of a insect infestation to describe the invading armies because the, the armies of the Assyrians were massive. In that day, the Lord would use a razor hired from beyond the Euphrates River, the king of Assyria, to shave your head in private parts and to cut off your beard also. Now understand what it's talking about when it talks about uh, shaving off the hair. This isn't just that you're shaving things off. It's an example of extreme humility. Nahum describes to us the, the hatred towards Assyria because Nahum is a book about a prophecy of the disruption of Nineveh, the capital of Assyria. Woe to the city of blood, that's Nineveh, full of lies, full of plunder, never without victims, the crack of whips, the clatter of wheels, galloping horses and jolted chariots, charging cavalry, flashing swords and glittering spears, many casualties, piles of dead, bodies without number, people stumbling over courses, all because of the wanton lust of a prostitute, alluring the mistress of sorceries, who enslaved nations by her prostitution and peoples by her witchcraft. And in Jonah, we also hear about <clears throat> hatred towards the Assyrians. Jonah, remember, had been sent to Nineveh to warn them that God was going to destroy them if they didn't repent. Well, Jonah didn't want to go, not because he was afraid of the Assyrians, because he didn't want them to repent. And when they do, in Jonah 3, he is all upset because he wants to see instead the Assyrians getting wiped out. So his reaction is the repentance of the people of Nineveh. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. He became angry. He prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? This is why I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you're a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better me to die than to live. He's so upset about it, he wants to die. Because what he really would like to see is Assyria wiped out. Well, here you see the land of Israel at the time of Hezekiah. And you see the divided kingdom of Judah and Israel and Aram in the north. Now, Aram and Israel, the northern kingdom, are going to be wiped out by the Assyrian invasion. Isaiah 37, the angel of the Lord went out and put death 185,000 in the Assyrian camp. When the people got up the next morning, there were all dead bodies. So Sennacherib, king of Israel, Assyria, withdrew, broke camp and withdrew. He returned to Nineveh and stayed there. So the Assyrians got to Judah, and all that's really left is the city of Jerusalem. But Hezekiah prays to God, and God sends this angel of death to kill 185,000, the Assyrians withdrew, and Israel is spared. Now, here is Sennacherib's record 
which has found archaeological evidence in modern-day Iraq, where Assyria was in the northern part. And it says this, as to Hezekiah the Jew, he did not sit to me a yoke, Hezekiah himself. He did send me later to Nineveh, my lordly city, together with 30 talents of gold and 800 talents of silver. So we do have here the record that he did not capitulate, that Hezekiah did not give in to the Assyrians, but it doesn't give the record of what happened here with the slaying of the army. Now, you would think, well, that's just a miracle that really didn't happen. No. If you look at the ancient records of all these things, they only tell the positive. They're very propagandistic. And so if there's any kind of a defeat or calamity, they don't mention. They only mention the positive part. So a source, he's going to say he's willing to mention that Hezekiah defied if he's not going to talk about how God rescued them. Uh, you see that even with like the Egyptians, you have a pharaoh like King Tut, whose famous remains we all know about. Well, if you read the records about King Tut, it talks about him being this great pharaoh. And yet we know from other sources from history that he was a very minor pharaoh and he died at a very young age. He was insignificant, wouldn't be remembered if, except for the fact that his burial treasury was recovered. And probably the reason why it's recovered is because it was so much smaller than the great pharaohs whose remains had been robbed over the courses of the centuries. This is a reconstruction of ancient Nineveh that began in northern Iraq. A lot of it's been torn down since by the movements in of the radical Islamics in Iraq since the fall of Saddam Hussein, uh, but gives you an idea of how great the city was and how feared Assyria was. Why spare, though, Judah from Israel only to have them fall to Babylon? That's the thing I really want to focus on, the big picture. Yeah, we have this story about how God miraculously spares Jerusalem and Hezekiah from the Assyrians, but later on, he allows the Babylonians to destroy them. It's just kind of a, a putting off, a temporary thing. Eventually, Judah's going to be destroyed anyway. So why does God spare them, though, from the Assyrians? Well, in 2 Kings 17, we hear that the king of Israel bought people from Babylon, Kutha, Ava, Hamath, and Sepharim, and settled them to the towns of Samaria to replace the Israelites. They took over Samaria and lived in the towns. Now, Samaria is the northern kingdom. Why do that? Well, the way that the Assyrians would take control of their enemies is by forcibly moving people to different areas. We think of the, the compliance of African slaves compared to Native Americans in the colonies here in the Americas. At first, the colonists tried to use the Native Americans to do a lot of the labor, but it was, they were unsuccessful in many ways because what the Native Americans would do is they'd flee into the interior and stay with their relatives. they get away from it. But the African slaves, by comparison, were very compliant why? Because here they were transported thousands of miles away from their homeland. They had nowhere else to go. They were cut off from their culture, from their background. So the only thing that they had, the only thing was what they knew from their slave masters. In 1968, I remember the famous Prague Spring when Czechoslovakia, which was part of the Iron Curtain, rebelled against it's controlled by the communists. And so the Soviet Union sent in troops, not from nearby countries from the Soviet Union, but from their Asian territories. Why? Because if they brought in people from the local areas in the Soviet Union, a lot of them had Czech blood in them, they had relationship with them, they would be sympathetic to the people. But if they brought soldiers from the far part of the Soviet Union who were from a completely different culture, they would be much more willing to brutally put down the rebellion. This is what the Assyrians did. By taking people away from their homelands, away from their connections, they were able to subdue them. 
Now it tells us about these people that were settled from the far end, the far eastern end, end of the Assyrian Empire into Samaria. They worshipped the Lord, but they also appointed all sorts of their own people to officiate for them as priests in the shrines at the high place. The high places were always the site for pagan worship. They worshipped the Lord, but they also served their own gods according to the customs of the nations from which they'd been brought. Now, in 2 Kings 25, though, by comparison, we hear of the destruction of the southern kingdom, this time by Babylon. In the 37th year of the exile of Jehoiachin, king of Judah, in the year Awal Marduk became king of Babylon. He released Jehoiachin, king of Judah, from his prison. He did this on the 27th day of the 12th month. He spoke kindly to him and gave him a seat of honor higher than those of the other kings who were with him in Babylon. So Jehoiachin put aside his prison clothes and for the rest of his life ate regularly at the king's table. Day by day the king Jehoiachin a regular allowance as long as he lived. Now what's so significant about this? Well, we see a contrast with what happened to the people in the northern kingdom of Israel who were defeated by the Assyrians, and the people in the south, in Judea, who were captured by the Babylonians. And in fact, the people who were captive to the Babylonians from Judah were, became known as Jews. Well, unlike the Assyrians, who were far more brutal, the way the Babylonians seek control was rather by wiping out the identity of the conquered people, they would change their allegiance to that of Babylon. They'd take people from among the leadership and train them to become future leaders in Babylon. We think of many of the people that were exiled from Judah to Babylon were the leading people, the leaders. People like we know later, Daniel. And these people then, by becoming training them within the Babylonian system, they became good and effective leaders for the empire. Whereas the Assyrians had tried to wipe out their identity completely. So what we see with the northern kingdom of Israel is kind of a loss of them from history. They get so spread out and so thinned out and lost out that they forget about God. You see how, yeah, they kind of worship God in the north, but they also worship pagan gods. And it got to the point where very few of them were left. In fact, there's a small group still left in modern day Israel called the Samaritans. They are the descendants of those 10 tribes. We call them the 10 lost tribes in the north. But there are only a handful of them. They're the only ones left. By comparison, the exiles from Judah kept their identity as God's people as a distinct nation. Now, why is that significant? Well, back in 1 Kings 11, God spoke to his prophet to Solomon. So the Lord said to Solomon, since it's your attitude and you've not kept my covenant, my decrees, which I commanded you, I will certainly tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your subordinates. Nevertheless, for the sake of David, your father, I will not do it during your lifetime. I will tear it out of the hand of your son. Yet I will not tear the whole kingdom from him, but will give him one tribe for my sake of my David, my servant, and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. So Solomon, because he allowed idolatry to go on in the land, especially from the wives that he took from pagan nations, God's punishment was that the nation would be divided after him. But because of the sake of David, he says, he would allow one tribe to remain faithful to the family of Solomon, and they would continue. And what we see is God fulfilling this promise by not only having the nation divided, but allowing Jerusalem to be protected with Hezekiah from the Assyrians, so that later when it's taken by the Babylonians, they still have an identity. And even though Jerusalem and the temple are destroyed, God allows, through the Persians who come later on, allows the people to return back from exile and rebuild Jerusalem and the temple. Why this is because God wants his plan is that salvation is to come through David, through the tribe of Judah. What we see throughout the Old Testament history is how God had chosen a nation of Israel to be his means to bring about salvation. 
But then God allows the nation of Israel to get smaller, eventually allows it only to be the kingdom of Judah, and eventually only those who return from captivity because he's whittling it down to the source of salvation, the one person, our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom he's going to rebuild a new Israel based not on the genetics of Abraham, but the faith of Abraham, what we call the church. And why is David important to this? Well, God had promised David in 2 Samuel. After King David was settled in his palace and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, he said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am, living in a house of cedar, while the ark of God remains in a tent. Nathan replied to the king, Whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it, for the Lord is with you. But that night the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says. Are you one to build me a house to dwell in? Have I not dwelt in the house from this day? I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt to this day. He's talking about the tabernacle, the tent that Moses and the people of God were, were commanded to set up in the wilderness. And they continued with that even under Joshua when they entered in the promised land. I've been moving from place to place with a tent as my dwelling. Wherever I've moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of the rulers who I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now then tell my servant David, this is what the Lord God says. I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock, and appointed you ruler over my people Israel. I've been with you wherever you've gone, and I've cut off all your enemies from before you. Now I'll make your name great, like the names of the greatest men on earth. I will provide a place for my people Israel, and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own, and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore, as they did at the beginning." And have done ever since the time I appointed leaders over my people Israel. I will also give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever." I will be his father and he will be my son. And when he does wrong, I will punish him with the rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. But my love will never be taken away from, as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me, and your throne will be established forever. Now the people of Israel were first to think of this as saying that the nation of Judah would never fall. God would never allow Jer Jerusalem to fall. And they, when the Babylonians did take it, they were totally shocked, thought this is the end. But then as the Persians conquer the Babylonians, allow the people to return, now they're seeing, oh, God is going to restore it that way. But it never really happened because not only do they not become a great nation, but they're always under somebody else. First the Persians, then the Greeks under Alexander, then the Romans. Uh, and when they do have a period of freedom from the Greeks, it's not led by a kingly figure, somebody from the tribe of Judah, the tribe of David, but from the priestly clan, the, the Maccabees. Uh, they're, they're religious leaders, not political. So it seems as though God's promise is not fulfilled. But it's not fulfilled in that way because God has something bigger in store, namely Christ Jesus. The promise to David comes true in Jesus. That's why what I just read to you from 2 Samuel is so often used in late Advent as we anticipate the coming of Jesus on Christmas. That That's how God fulfilled it. And he would be the leader of a kingdom, not just of Jews, but of all people, and not just for his lifetime, but forever, which is fulfilled for us in Christ Jesus. And it's important for God that that happened through the line of David because of that promise and also because by doing it through David, through Jerusalem, is to ensure that it's through the worship of God. The problem with the northern kingdom of Israel it got so caught up in all the idolatry that the religion, the faith of the people was mixed into that. But what happens 
As a result of the Babylonian captivity, it's the people living in captivity and returning now finally get it that they can't get mixed up in the idolatry. Now, the you think of the enemies of Jesus at his time, the Jewish enemies, and certainly had a lot of problems. But one of the things you couldn't accuse them of was getting involved in pagan idolatry. They finally got it through their heads. We've got to stay away from that. And so any sign of that kind of idolatry had been eliminated so that they were ready now to hear the gospel, which comes solely through the one God and his son, Christ Jesus. Because there were examples of people who branched off from that before that, who tried to kind of worship God, but they didn't last. You think of Elephantine Egypt, where a group of people fled before the Babylonians and went to Egypt, and they set up temples to worship God, but it was mixed up with the paganism and it didn't last. You know, another example in Leontipus, Egypt. And Jeremiah, as the conquest by the Babylonians was taking place, warned them and said that they shouldn't do that. They shouldn't try to establish a temple in Jerusalem, that they need to remain faithful to God. And even if God took them into captivity, he would bless them. And so those temples were destroyed but the real temple in Jerusalem was rebuilt by God. Now in John 4, we see an allusion to this in the story of Jesus and the woman at the well. The woman at the well is a Samaritan, one of those descending from the tribes in the north. And who I said before, a lot of them are mixed up with the paganism, but there were a group of them that tried to be remain faithful to the Old Testament, even though they only look to the first five books of the Old Testament. So in his conversation with this woman, Jesus says, Woman, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain or in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is where the temple was. That was the holiest site to the Jews. For the Samaritans, it was Mount Gerizim. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know for salvation is from the Jews. So showing that the plan of salvation was to go through David and his house. Because the Samaritans are kind of the side, the real direction is going through Jews and Jerusalem, because that's what God's plan is. Yet as time is coming, and now will come when the worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. Now, she doesn't understand at this point, but this is alluding to Jesus, that the true worshipers will worship not an earthly temple, but the eternal temple in Christ Jesus our Lord. They are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worship is, must worship him in spirit and in truth. That's why it's important that salvation comes from the Jews to avoid that idolatry that was involved in the northern kingdom and to fulfill the firm promise that God had made to David. That's the way God decided to do it. And this altogether true ensures that it's about grace alone. Because the thing about Judah is it's weaker now. Uh, if you look at the history of Judah and Israel, usually Israel was stronger. Judah was the weaker of the two. It was spared not because of its strength, but because of its protection from God. And its descendants never become prominent in a political, earthly sense. But they see that it's by grace alone, which is really made evident in Christ Jesus. This is a diagram that I heard, which I think really makes that very good and really helps with all that. This is a diagram showing how Israel changes in its attitude from the old Israel, which, like I said, is the descendants of Abraham and as it narrows down over time to just the descendants of Judah and finally the remnant who returned from captivity to the one person, Christ Jesus, in the center. He's the true Israel. And from him comes the new Israel, those who share the faith of Abraham, those who have faith in Christ Jesus, the church. So that all these promises, all this stuff with Israel, what does it involve? More than anything else, it involves the Christian church, God's salvation, his total plan through Christ Jesus our Lord. We pray. Lord God, we thank you for how you use people like Hezekiah to bring about your eventual plan of salvation 
in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen.